Here we are with the world shepherd himself, Dr. Stewart. Uh, Michelle and I had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of years ago, and he's an extraordinary man. The last time we were here, got quite the education on sheep, politics, world events, Georgia Godstones, which no longer exist around here anymore. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so, Doctor, why don't you tell everybody what you do? Well, I'm a, a production veterinarian by training, and we do mostly reproduction in sheep and goats and two or three species of deer and sometimes elk, and my partners work with with a horse and, and uh, cattle. Um, but my, my love and my project is to try to strengthen rural America and strengthen communities. Um, and, and we have so much uh, concentration now in agriculture, especially in animal agriculture. So what we've been trying to do is, is adapt um, a bloodline of sheep to be able to survive uh, on southern pastures and southern legumes and not have to haul in uh, cereal grains from the Midwest. So for about four or five years now, we've been nothing but foragers, no cereal grains at all. So we, we uh, have um, been selecting for 17 generations now for parasite resistance, 12 generations for carcass traits, and this morning we're delivering four really nice ewe lambs um, um, to the family here and, uh, and a ram uh, shortly to breed them. But these girls were, they're a little over 100 pounds and they were born in late March, which is pretty sporty. And that's on all grass, all wow. forage, all grass. Um, we don't use uh, creep feeders. We don't use cereal grains. We don't use fertilizers. We don't use pesticides. Um, and we don't use antibiotics. Um, we haven't used antibiotics for respiratory or enteric infections now for 15 years. So it's about using our skills. But what we want to do is um, we would like people to, to learn our concept and to use year-round forages to let these animals thrive because there's so much value in the entire chain. If you look at it, if you use perennial legumes, you're not digging the dirt up every That's year. Right. You're not right. use, losing the topsoil. We have one legume that we use here that puts 190 pounds of nitrogen per acre into the into where it's growing. So we haven't used fertilizers here now in almost five years. So our plan is to, to try to take this to as many people as we can. The 70% of the world would benefit by this sort of strategy because uh, it's only in the United States and several highly developed countries where we're so organized and so technical and so scientific because uh, uh, the the food web is turned into a chain and right. it's concentrated in at the moment probably too few hands. Um, we found out with a hundred and 20 nanometer virus uh, how concentrated these food plants were um, we started having you know when five when five companies control the entire beef supply in the United States and one of these plants has thousands of workers when the COVID hit you know this is a problem um, when I started in my profession we had over 10,000 abattoirs and processing facilities in America 1969 um, Pure Food and Drug Act, and now we're less than 2,000. And, uh, you know, regionally, we need to build this back up, and we need to get this into a sense of community where people are counting on each other and talking to each other and having relationships with each other. Our kids today think that milk comes from a carton at McDonald's and, and not from a dairy cow. And, uh, most kids today don't know that, you know, that lactation is a result of of a birth of an animal you what know before, it's, before yeah i mean they say well dairy cow they just give milk you know so <laughs> it's uh it, it, you know so we're trying to replicate this concept and we've been working for five years um with a group of perennial legume growers down on the florida georgia line and um trying to spread this concept as wide as we can so long term it's about a a reproducible sustainable uh, uh, way of growing meat uh, and and having community without having to bring products in from all over the globe to make that thing work and and right now I mean we we have already seen what 
supply chain problems we can That's have. Ninety right. percent of our of our antibiotics and drugs are bulk drugs are coming from offshore. This is not a good situation. And thankfully, we produce a lot of meat in this country. But uh, you know, uh, the whole origin of the of Western culture came from when the Greeks came out of the Dark Ages and they started organizing around um, around uh, uh, raising animals and raising vegetables and so forth. And and Victor Davis Hanson's has got a book about this called The Other Greeks. And he basically said that that became the polis or the city state. And, uh, and that all Western culture came from that. You know, so I think we're, we've weakened it. And I don't know how much longer, you know, the, the government is broke. We're just printing money and, and the economy is in sad shape and the real inflation numbers are probably closer to 20 than they are to 10. I'd mark you even 30. Yeah. And uh, so we've got to get to the position where we can take care of each other. And so the point of that is all commodities that we're growing, name the top five, you know, corn, soybeans are the top two, but everyone you can name, including wheat, peanuts and so forth, they all lose money. Right, they, so it's but, subsidies. Yeah, and if it wasn't for the government subsidies, That's right. but we've got guys that are producing legume forages for us that are part of our system here that are making $2,000 an acre without a government subsidy. How about that? So how much longer are we going to be able to pay this out? I don't know. So it's, uh, it's my vision and labor of many years to try to get to this place. We've got the sheep worked out now. The sheep, I mean, I, I've got ewes here that, uh, you know, we haven't dewormed in six or eight years. Um, and, and it's just incredible. This animal is, uh, is, is a beautiful animal. I've been in production animal medicine for 40 years with multiple species, things that had feathers on them, things that had scales on them, and things that had wool and not wool and so forth and and this is the most delightful animal i've messed with and if you haven't eaten any hair sheep lamb oh you don't know what you're missing i don't think i tell everybody as a as a butcher myself i tell everybody i come across the best meat i've ever had in my life and i made the claim and some people might think it's absurd if you could put kobe beef next to Katahdin lamb or any other kind of hair sheep, and I would take that sheep any oh, day. Oh, absolutely. Any day over a blind tail. Our family eats that, and we, we by word of mouth and by exposure, we brought a lot of people to eating lamb that didn't even know they liked it. Mm -hmm. And uh, whenever I was a kid, we our per capita consumption of lamb was about 7.8 pounds. Okay, now it's less than a pound. Wow. And 63% of our lamb meat comes from 10,000 miles away. New Zealand, Australia. Yeah, and like that. sometimes Argentina or, or uh, well, Uruguay, for example. They've got some inspected plants down there now that bring it here. But, you know, if you care about green and if you care about and you believe in all the carbon stuff, uh, that's not a good deal. No. You know, no, no, but so I think we need to go back to producing them local. I mean, look at these beautiful. Yeah, I know animals. they are something else. Look at the babies running around. So, I mean, Doctor, I mean, you have clearly. I mean, the reason we're here is because of what you do, and you made such an impression on my wife the first time she ever made met you. Then when I came here and met you the first time, I'm like, okay, I think I just got a PhD understanding in how the world really works. And it's been a it's been a blessing to me and everybody else out there that I've had a chance to evangelize some of this information to. But real quick, there's a number of people out there that are also wondering what they should or shouldn't do in terms of mineral when it comes to their sheep. Now we we use only the stuff you sell. Is there a way they can acquire that? Uh, sure, they can come to us, call us World Shepherd Project online, or uh, call me uh, Stuart Veterinary Services, either one. But the right way to develop m m optimum level of minerals is by consistent change, but by by assay of liver. Okay, that's the only way. So for nine or ten years, what we did was we kept changing the trace mineral formula until we got optimal levels in the in the lambs that we were killing. And when we did that, when we got, and when I was in veterinary school, if they, they told me that if a truck went by on the highway a mile up there and he had 
copper on the back of the truck, it'd probably kill my sheep. You know, that's that's what they taught us. Well, that ain't that, exactly true. No, it? it's not. It's not for hair sheep for for sure. Now there are some breeds of sheep that are extremely sensitive. Wool breeds that are extremely sensitive to copper. But once you get the copper right in these hair sheep breeds, your twinning incidence goes up. Your lack of foot problems. Your lack of respiratory problems. It's help with parasites. It's just a. It's a whole different world and. Uh, I, I tell you what, it, it took us nine years to get it to that point. Um, and you can get reasonable evaluation of most minerals by serum samples, you know, from a blood sample, but not copper. And copper has to come from the liver from the acid. because it's stored in the, cop, in, the, in the liver. So, you know, uh, you can get close, but you can't get there. And if you look at what copper is doing for you, um, I work in white-tailed deer and, and mule deer and, and fallow deer and elk and so forth. And and those guys are copper hogs. I mean, and but this last year we had a 187% lamb crop. Okay, so that means every <laughs> you out here is averaging, giving us 1.87 babies, okay? And you can't do that if you're copper deficient. So it sounds to me that everything that is officially proclaimed, whether it's what we ought to eat, the vaccines or jabs we ought to take and everything else, sounds to me that like everything else, you're finding out that maybe that's not exactly the case when you get down to bread. Because everybody tells you that if you give them copper, they're going to die. Yeah. And you're saying that's not exactly no, it the has, case with it, it, it has to be done with, you know, judicious use. But unfortunately, I, I had someone very famous uh, with a quote the other day that said that he was a storyteller and we live in a post-truth world. And so his job was to tell stories. And, and you know, that doesn't work for me. I'm a scientist. You know, <laughs> I, I want to know the truth. That that real nice book that has those 66 inside of it, that's got oh, a lot yeah. of truth in it, you know, and, and uh, I, 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 it's not a post-truth world for me. I agree. So, I agree. So what we're trying to do is to get people to understand how delightful this type of lifestyle is, how delightful that animal is um, to take care of and, and to be around. And, you know, I, I raised two girls with chores here on this farm and... Both of them had work ethic. Both of them knew the Lord. Both of them knew right from wrong. And both of them have been very successful. They're both in the medical field. And, uh, you know, having chores and growing up here without, uh, without doing this all the time probably didn't hurt them. Well, you know, there was a guy that said adversity makes men, prosperity makes monsters, and we've been maybe a little too prosperous for a little too long. Yeah. Or maybe things come a little too easy when all, like you said, we can just pick up these phones and do whatever. But, and, and we're, we're getting a lot of knowledge. We get a lot of knowledge out of this thing. We're getting bombarded with lots of facts, but the problem is we've lost critical thinking you know, how to put things together. So I'll get a bunch of information off of here, that's fine, but how do I put that together in in a working system, okay? And and what, what I'm interested in is, is animal biology. I'm not just interested in animal husbandry because I'm looking at everything these girls are exposed to. I mean, we're getting ready to get down into the teens here, you know, and, and we've got freeze-proof faucets and so forth, but we've opened up the ponds and making sure they've got plenty of heat in their belly when it gets down to 14 degrees here in a couple of days. You know, that's uh, that's looking at the animal as a whole, not just, you know, how we feed them and how we take care of them. It's, it's the system that they live in. And it is I, a beautiful, beautiful I'll tell you system. what that's interesting to me. If you look at, if you look at grass fed animals like this, if you look at omega threes, which when we were kids, the omega six, three ratio was roughly one to one. Now it's 20 to one. And that's the source of a lot of inflammation is, you know, the omega sixes where these animals are chock full of that plus conjugated linoleic acid, um, plus minerals, uh, and heme iron, which is a way more available form of iron because of the way that they're raised, you know? And, and the other thing that bothers me, uh, after being in this business a long time, is the amount of waste products that are making their way into animal feed. You don't say. Well, I mean, we're recycling a lot of proteins, oh, right, from the abattoirs okay. and the processing facilities. 
And uh, well, it seems odd for it to be in the feet of an animal like this. But well, I mean, I've got some species in the whitetail, for example, they smell blood meal in the in the in the diet. They won't eat it. Right. But right. we're we're basically recycling a lot of proteins and a lot of fats, and they're not always taken care of in the best way. You know, and and uh, those things that we used to go to the landfill with, mm, some of those things are making their way back into animal feeds. And and the, well, the 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 example of microplastics. You ever mm. looked at that? Yeah. Oh yeah. That's scary. It's everywhere. It's That's even scary. in the air now. I just read an article the other day. They said yeah. we're breathing this stuff now. Yeah. So so um, <laughs> you know we're going to do our part to make sure these girls are. All vegetable diets, you know, no recycled proteins and fats, nothing that's been rancid and then shoved down. Coming right from the ground the way the good yeah, morning. Yeah. Well, like you said, you know, um, you know, there was somebody in that 66 books you were just discussing, um, somebody I view as my Lord and Savior that said he is the way, the truth. And like you said, in this post-truth world, as some like to believe, at least it's, it's good to know that there are a few people out there and scientists and like yourself that really, that really uh, still see to it. That, it may it stays that way so it's been a real joy to to hang out with you doctor well, thank good. you so much yeah y'all come back i look forward to well i'll be coming back to get that sheep. ram all right good deal <laughs> thank you thank you yeah.